Hey, welcome to Financial Revelations, a podcast about finance, politics, the intersection of uh, many things, but especially those two things. I am David Safransky, your host. And today, normally we would be talking about the um, employment numbers, we'd be talking about what Congress is doing, we'd be talking about the markets, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But it is September 10th, and 20 years ago tomorrow, uh, we were attacked by terrorists. And I want to talk a little bit about that today, but um, before we get there, you can follow me on Twitter at... FI Revelations, FI Revelations, and you can, there's a little search bar when you log into Twitter, and you can uh, put my name in there if you can spell it, which is not easy. I'll tell you what, we're going to put my name spelled right up here, uh, and you can search me out on, on Twitter, and, and what I want to do is I want to just take some unscientific uh, polls, research, do things like that to see what people are thinking, so follow me on Twitter. You can also... Uh, f- uh, email me questions, Joshua at epsf.com. And you don't have to remember this because it's all going to be uh, right above me here. And then on Thursday mornings from 8 to 9, I am live on the radio on WCRF 103.3. It's a Moody radio station. They have the Moody radio app, so you can listen uh, wherever in the world you are at if you have access to the Internet. You can listen live, and you could text in questions right from the app. So we take live questions. Uh, there's I don't have any pre-screening to the questions. They just pop up, and I answer them. And, and every once in a while, I get stumped a little bit, and I'm not afraid to say I don't know. Uh, so if you have questions and you want them answered live on the radio, Thursday mornings, 8 to 9 Eastern, Moody Radio, 103.3 if you're in the Cleveland area, or the Moody Radio app if you're anywhere else. So today I want to talk a little bit about uh, September 11, 20 years ago, but I, I want to focus on one person in particular who I found uh, particularly compelling. And I've seen a lot of, of the video from 20 years ago, and I have to say it is as shocking today, I think, as it was when I saw it that morning. And I, I didn't see the first plane hit. I remember coming home from the gym, uh, we had somebody working in our house that day, and I had had to meet him there in the morning. And I turn on the news, and they're talking about a plane hitting uh, World Trade Center. And it, it's happened before. Little planes get off course. They're they're hard to correct. The people don't know where they're at. They they misgauge their um, altitude. And there's some talk that it was a 737, if I remember correctly. And then we saw the second plane hit the World Trade Center, and we kind of knew it was on. Uh, The president was in Florida that day reading to uh, um, some kids in in an elementary school, and I remember Andy Card going up to him and whispering in his ear, we're under attack. And they they break off, and uh, there's pictures of the president taking phone calls. They got him on Air Force One, and he was in the air because that they thought that was the safest place uh, because planes were, were heading back and uh, to Washington, D.C., and they thought that uh, there was going to be more attacks. Then the, the Pentagon got hit, and uh, I have a friend who's a pilot, and I was talking to him this week, and I asked him, what were you doing that day? And he said, I was in the air. He was flying uh, a small private plane uh, for a company. And he said the air traffic control uh, person came on and just said, what are your intentions? And he was, he was about uh, just a little less than 20 minutes away from his destination. And they said, you have to be on the ground in 20 minutes. All air flight, all airplanes are grounded within 20 minutes. So he, he made it to Indianapolis where he was flying to and he knew something bad was happening, but uh, he couldn't watch the news or anything on this type of plane. So when the, they were totally shocked when they landed. And over Cleveland, Flight 93, uh, which eventually crashed in uh, Shanksville, Pennsylvania, there's a memorial there now, was Todd Beamer. Uh, Todd Beamer was on Flight 93, and uh, I was reading an article this week about the phone call that he made. If you you were a flyer back then on commercial airlines, you probably remember there wasn't a TV in your seat back in front of you. There was a phone. 
uh, I had only seen, there was a phone in every seat. I had probably seen those phones used three times in my entire life uh, flying. He picked up the phone and he called the operator from the airline. And her name is Lisa Jefferson. And she was kind of recounting the phone call. And she said he was so calm when he called and recounted what was going on and what he was seeing and, and she told him what was happening because they had no way of knowing. Uh, she thought it was uh, that he was not being genuine. She thought it was a prank call. And he told her what was going on and then uh, right before he finished the call, uh, he asked her if she would pray with him. And he prayed, they prayed together. He recited the Lord's Prayer and then he recited the, the 23rd Psalm, and she said his, his voice was devoid of any stress, just like any other conversation. And while the phone connection was still on, he turned to some other people on the plane, and he said, are you guys ready? Okay, let's roll. And then those people, I don't know even how many it was, uh, they went up to the cockpit, and they forced that plane into the ground. They that plane, they think, was coming back to the White House uh, or someplace in Washington, D.C., uh, and they made sure that that plane did not make it back to D.C. And he left a wife, Lisa, and uh, two children. He was a Wheaton College graduate. He was the captain of the basketball team. His wife, Lisa, said that he once he was also on the soccer team, and he once knowingly played a soccer game with a broken jaw. That's he was a competitor, and uh, it, the the story was compelling to me because I've always said, as a believer, uh, if my plane was going to crash, I want to be the calm one on the plane. Now I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but I'd like to think it would. But he actually was the calm one on the plane, and it, the story is really compelling to me because, to me, uh, it's a story more about his faith. He was not afraid. He knew where he was going. He knew what was going to happen. He had been informed of what was going on on the other planes. We didn't know how many planes were out there. That plane turned around right above Cleveland. There's a air traffic, air traffic control center out in Oberlin, and that's who had the handoff on that plane, and they were trying to reach him. And when they couldn't, they scrambled jets to go find that plane. Um, they never did find it they just, because... Those people, Todd Beamer and his co-conspirators, made sure that those hijackers, those cowards on the plane, never made it back to Washington, D.C. Uh, saved, we have no idea how many lives that they saved by taking their own. And those are the stories I really want to remember. Um, I, I don't want to talk about the, the hijackers. They were a bunch of pansies uh, hurting innocent people. Uh, they weren't. Uh, they, they were cowards is what they are, were, will always be. And, but people like Todd Beamer or the people who rushed into the Pentagon to save people or uh, the firemen that were running up uh, while everybody was running away, those are the stories that I want to remember because those are inspiring uh, to all of us. And that's really the story of America. We look out for each other. Uh, we're always going to look out for each other no matter what's going on today. Uh, and as September 11th is upon us, um, you know, remember what it was like for the couple of weeks, the couple of months, the year after that happened, how the, the political division kind of stopped. People went to church. So, you know, I, I felt a little uh, stranded uh, for a while, just uneasy about everything. And, and those feelings, they're, they're gone now, of course. Uh, political division is right. Uh, but remember that how great America was after that, how we came together. That was really something. Remember, President Bush went to New York. Uh, we started playing sports shortly after that, and he threw a perfect strike at Yankee Stadium. And it, it was really awe-inspiring. And um, I remember somebody from the Boston Red Sox gave a speech and he used some foul language. Boy, was it was right on point when he said it. David, uh, big guy, big home run hitter. I can't remember his name, but um, it was it was really a special time uh, after we, the way we came together. And I want to remember those things and the heroes. That's what I want to remember. Not not those cowards that uh, took over the planes from on innocent people. Um, 
So remember that as you're as we come up on September 11th, maybe sit with your family. My boys are all going to be home this weekend. We're doing a brisket on the smoker. We're going to watch the Browns. We're going to kind of huddle. Uh, we have a kid that just graduated from college. We're going to celebrate. Those are all good things. Spend some time with your family and and just cherish those things because we we talk about money all the time here. Um, but one thing we realized in September 11th is that it's only money. It's only things. You get all that stuff back, but you can't get people back. And so cherish the people. Cherish the time. Uh, you're not going to have that again. So uh, that's my mission for you this weekend uh, on September 11th, on Sunday. Go to church. Pray for those people. Pray for the survivors. There's a lot of people who are still living September 11th and 12th and 13th and 14th and every day after has been September 11th for them. And uh, we do need to lift them up in prayer and be there if we can uh, and help them uh, forgive. It's hard to forgive sometimes, especially something like that and move on. So financially, uh, the virus is bad. It's The virus is every bit as bad now as it ever was. I'm surprised we're not talking about lockdowns. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to let you know this. I, I am fully vaccinated. And I think it would be wise for you two to get vaccinated. I think it'd be okay. I, I would never make anyone get vaccinated. And I will defend your right not to get vaccinated. But I think the vaccines are probably safe. And for me, it, it's, it was a little bit easier for me. And I'll tell you why. I was in the Army. I was in the Army for about 10 years or so. And in basic training... Uh, you walk through this line. It, it's really funny because they give you your clothes in basic training, but you're not allowed to put them on. So you're walking around carrying your clothes in your underwear and boots. It's the army. Uh, of course, they would do that. And you go to this medical center where they give you, I don't know, it seemed like 20 shots to me. And when I get my vaccination card, there's three things, three or four things on it. That's it. And so I have been shot with so many vaccinations. I didn't. It didn't really bother me to get one more. I had no ill effects from it. You may have had a different experience, but uh, I think it's probably safe. I do think it's more of a therapeutic than a vaccination, though, because if I get vaxxed and I can still get the virus, I struggle to call it a vaccination. And if it's a therapeutic, that's okay with me, too. Uh, I don't mind those things. If I were to get it and I get uh, less ill, and a far greater uh, or far less chance of being hospitalized, that's a risk I'm willing to take. So I would suggest that you get the vaccination, uh, but I'm going to defend your right not to get it also. Uh, but given the fact that the virus is so dramatically worse now, the economy is slowing. It's slowing a lot. Uh, we have 10.9 million jobs open. A lot of people are afraid to go back to work. We we did do away. Now, about 8 million people are no longer getting the COVID kicker. Uh, the the uh, moratorium on evictions is was ruled unconstitutional, so people are going to get evicted. I think people are going to go back to work. Uh, and I think you are going to see somewhat of a pickup in the economy, but uh, probably not in the data this month and maybe not even the first half of October. Joe Biden, his presidency is very weak and it's and it's getting worse. The Afghanistan debacle was really, we're going to live with that for a couple of decades, I think. Just the news, the footage, the results, uh, the Taliban, uh, they're in control again. Uh, they have a lot of American citizens that they're going to bargain with, and it's not a good thing. It, it's a, it's an extreme sign of weakness. And what I think is going to happen is I think on the world stage, we're probably going to see an event or a series of smaller events that challenge Americans America's dominance, whether it be Iran starting a reactor, North Korea firing a missile, China flexing. If I were China, I would move to solidify Taiwan right now. I don't think that they believe that the Biden administration is in a position to do anything about it, nor would they. And they're probably right. I hate to say that. Uh, so I could see a series of challenges coming. Uh, they don't have to be necessarily black swan events 
uh, where it crashes everything, but there's going to be a lot of testing. And I think you're going to see those things because America's political leaders are seen as weak right now on the world stage. And it was a, a, Afghanistan was very embarrassing for America. We did accomplish our mission there. There's no doubt about that. We, we decimated the terrorists. They're from Afghanistan, not a threat. Now, they could reconstitute themselves relatively quickly because they don't really have a command and control structure like the U.S. Army does. Uh, they, they could get a small ragtag band of people together and they're back. So can they threaten the homeland? Probably not right now. Uh, but listen, I want you to keep the faith. I would consider myself a fully invested bear. Um, I, I think that as long as the, the virus subsides, which I think it's going to do probably the Spanish flu lasted 26 months. This could last every bit as long or a little bit longer. So we have a little ways to go. Economically, I think we're going to be okay if my prediction of the events uh, don't happen. I want to stay invested. I have cash on the side. I want you guys to ask questions. We'll be here next week. I am David Zafransky. This is Financial Revelations, and we'll see you guys next week.